So welcome to Lessons with Lisa. Okay, so people ask me about recipes all the time. People like Lauren Bostick are saying, I can't cook anything. I just open a jar of tomato sauce and throw it in a pasta. Yes, you can. You want to make your own tomato sauce? Chop some onions. It can be scallions. It can be red onions, white onions. Put it in olive oil. Chop loads of tomatoes. It can be those little tiny ones. You can do a mixture of tomatoes. Put in some sea salt. Put in some garlic. Put in some white wine and bring it simmer for about 15 minutes and then you can keep it and then you can add anything to it mushrooms you can add fish you can add crab meat make your own stuff by the time your pasta's boiled you will have the tomato sauce easy simple he has to shag every time we start an interview because he wants his presence to be known. Are you okay with that? All right, have you done your shagging? Can I talk to John now? Welcome, John Lovitz, who's my friend, my neighbor. You know this guy. You've seen this guy Thank running you. up and down the street. Oh, yes. Yes. Is he your co-host? Yeah, he, he's got a lot to say, so watch out. <laughs> well, he shags. He doesn't have to say oh. much, you know? So, how are you? How have you been through this whole crazy experience? I, I mean, I've been good. I've been trying to exercise a lot, and I have a ways to go. Yeah, I play a lot of tennis, you know, tennis all the time. Oh, I saw. I saw that you and support then, the Chris Evert Foundation, the charity, right? Yeah. Well, I met Chris. Uh, she host. She hosted Saturday Night Live when I was on it. Oh, she did. And then um, years later, there's a friend of mine. Oh, you might know her, Maeve Quinlan, who used to play tennis, and she's an actress. And she's Chris's best friend, and she's one of my best friends. So I saw that Chris did this uh, charity tournament in Florida every year. Are you a good tennis player then? Uh, well, I, I'm good for an amateur. Right. But I've gotten a lot better recently. But, what, uh, through COVID, you've been playing? I keep getting better, yeah. Yeah. And uh, anyway, she'd been doing the charity for 11 years. So I, so I told Maeve, I said, well, tell, I know Chris from the show. Tell her I yeah. want to uh, do it. So she invited me, and then it's I've been going every year since, and it's I think it's in its 26th year. And unfortunately, this year they have to cancel it. But it raises money for um, for a, a women in Broward County, which is you know, a big county in Florida, right. South Florida, that uh, to if they're addicted to drugs or if they're homeless and gets them back on their oh, feet, great. gets them an education. Okay, and, that's and great. It's so much fun. I don't know how I'm having this is much it fun doubles? helping people. Do you play doubles or do you play yeah, singles? Yeah, like it would be like, say, one year it was a... Uh, 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 me and John McEnroe against his brother Pat. You and John McEnroe? Yeah. Oh, for God's sake! What is every, What Foley. do you say? Every every second is yours. It's yours. That's what I usually <laughs> say to the pros. Like, Here's our strategy. Yours. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And uh, <clears throat> he was pretty funny. I, I met him in New York years ago. But I said, John, do you have any uh, tips? He goes, I was warming up. He goes, Well, you could start by moving your feet. <laughs> and he just screams it. And then. So I started moving more and I was playing well and he was like, oh, oh, and he's pleased. Oh, he's pretty scary. And Scott's scary, really though. good. And in all fairness, I said to Scott, I go, look, we, I go, look at what we get to do. We get to play doubles with these guys. We both won. Wow. Well, I think you're probably a lot better than you kind of let on because if you're well, playing I with those guys. Well, I say good for an amateur, but I mean, I've been on the court with these guys and, and, you know, you meet club players. Oh, I could be a pro if I wanted. It's like, no, you couldn't. I mean, they're, it's like professional golfers. If, uh, Versus a scratch golfer. A scratch golfer is a, you know, the great. And I have a friend, a comedian too, Court McGowan. He's a scratch golfer. I said, could you be a pro? He goes, are you crazy? He goes, no way. He goes, you understand, these guys are so great. It's a, it's like 10, no, 10 levels, 20 levels above. It's all they've been doing every day, For all day sure. since they're five. You For know? sure. And the, the speed at which they hit it. You know, if I hit a great shot, uh, that you go like a pro to hit that shot. You know what happened though is I played tennis growing up and then I was doing a movie. Uh, I was on Saturday Night Live and I was doing this movie, uh, My Stepmother's an Aliens, and it was shooting in Los Angeles. So, right. so uh, Jerry Weintraub was producing and he's a great guy. So I got to stay at the Beverly Hills Hotel and I wanted to take tennis lessons. And it said Alex Almeida, Wimbledon champion. I is remember the pro. him. I remember him yeah. when they had them where the bungalows were. I remember. Right. And I'd never heard of him. I said, Well, who did you beat? You won Wimbledon? He goes, Yeah, he's from Peru. I go, Who did you beat? He goes, Rod Laver. I go, What? You beat Rod Laver at Wimbledon and I can have a lesson with you. And I was so excited. So I started taking lessons and for about two weeks. And usually I would play for two weeks and then stop for six months. I would, 
But I, because of him, I got so much better in two weeks. I thought, well, what if I didn't stop? How good could I get? And that was in 1988. So I've been basically playing, uh, you know, two, three times a week or more uh, er, er, since then. The truth is I am being modest. I, I actually won Wimbledon this year because they canceled it. So I went. Right? And you were the and only I, one that showed up. That's right. I won by I like default. That. And I said, put my name in the trophy. I can't help it that the other guys aren't here. <laughs> but I never am allowed to play in the Grand Slams. Well, whatever it takes. It's not good for the game. I'm well, 63 a- and I'm going to be beating. It's, you know, it's very. Uh, so that's your passion. Yeah. yeah. And I remember you said you were going to be doing the Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. And, and you tried to talk. Did I? <laughs> I think so. No. Oh. Of course, I didn't listen to you, says that. Well, but I realize, too, it's also business. It helps, you know, you're doing a show. It helps publicize your restaurants. And now you have other shows from it. Well, it's not It's a that. different it, kind of a business. It was know? a unique experience. And also some of the things that it afforded me in terms of things I've managed to create because of that, like my charity, which has been huge. Well, that's and all good. the um, platforms it's given me is second to none, really. And then it gave me a spin off and. And I've been a producer on that for eight years. So it, it's not just about that experience. It's all the things that... No, you got of, a whole business out yeah, of it. Yeah, exactly. So I've, I've had an amazing time. Well, I, but I'm not knocking it. But for me personally, I, I just... Yeah, no, I I did Celebrity that. Apprentice and the cameras are following you. And I, I, I couldn't stand it. Because I'm a pro... And I know you're an actress too. But for me, uh, like doing an interview like this is, I guess, reality. I don't know. But, the, but talking about... Your private life. See, then you have to. For me, you have to talk about other people, and then and there, it's their now their private life is exposed, and it's it, to me, it's just I I don't get it. To me, no. it's like who cares, and also it's nobody's business. Well, you know? also I'm very cognizant of the fact that I signed up for reality, and my kids were okay and supported that, but I don't drag other people, other members of my family into it you know if they well, what about your dogs did you ask ask well, them well they, they're just here you know well, like they um, they they're actually enjoying the experience they're kind of uh you know but they have feelings of course they have feelings and how many rescues do you have three three you can that talk about them huh? well you know i have my own rescue center why is it i'm around you i want to talk like this well you can if you like i'm Okay with that. Yes. That's why I gave you the tea. The I have two cats are... and a dog. Yeah. With my ever-changing schedule, it can be really difficult to maintain effective routines. And this is where Athletic Greens can help. Their daily all-in-one superfood powder is the easiest and most delicious nutritional habit that you can add to your routine. Whether you eat keto, paleo, uh, vegan, dairy-free, gluten-free, and it contains less than one gram of sugar without compromising on the taste, so it can easily fit into your diet. I really like it because sometimes, like vitamins, they don't sit well with my stomach and they make me feel sick, but this is like a powder. I sometimes actually mix mine with milk, but it's really delicious. I really like it. One scoop of Athletic Greens contains 75 vitamins, minerals, probiotics, and more that all work together to fill the nutritional gaps in your diet, increase your energy and focus, aid with digestion, and support a healthy immune system. Healthy immune system is of extreme importance right now. Anyway, Athletic Greens is doubling down on supporting your immune system during the winter. They are offering my audience free one-year supply, vitamin D, and five free travel packs with your first purchase if you visit my link today. So the travel packs you just pop in your bag. Anyway, simply visit athleticgreens.com slash Vanderpump to join the Athletic Greens community. Again, visit athleticgreens.com slash Vanderpump and get your free year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs today. You will love it. I love this Refair brand that I've recently found. It's basically an amazing skincare. Refair partners with prestige anti-aging skincare brands, and they sell directly to you for huge savings. They have everything you need from serums, um, moisturizers, uh, eye creams, toners, And let me tell you about this hydration cream. It's a moisturizer with 10 different essential oils, handmade from a farm in Spain. I love it. It's really gentle. It penetrates deeply. It 
feels great and it smells delicious and I don't get any breakouts, which is really important to me. My skin has always been absolute paramount importance. I think you're going to love this. If you buy this anywhere else, you would pay $120, but my listeners pay just 25 bucks when you purchase it through Refair. Check out this exclusive offer of my listeners. You will save 10% on all serums, eye creams, and moisturizers, plus get an anti-aging eye mask and free shipping. The only way to get these incredible products at unbelievable prices is to go to refskincare.com. That's R-E-F-S-K-I-N-C-A-R-E.com. At checkout, enter the code LISA. Do it now because when they sell out, they still be gone for good. And it's really fantastic. That's refskincare.com and enter my code LISA. That's refskincare.com. Do you think you have a, like a little bit of OCD? Because like, every time I kind of see you, you're driving a blue car with the same color eye eyeglasses, like a little obsessional, or and you've got the same color shirt, same color hat, same color glasses, same color car. Blue. Yeah, all blue. I mean, I have a little pink obsession. No, I'll tell you why. A little pink. I, I, but- I read an article and um, Taya Leone, who I, I met her on the movie A League of Their Own. And she was she came and she goes, I'm an actress. She was doing like extra work in it. She just did this to be in it. She had a small part. But anyway, she's very nice. But I read some article and they said, well, you always wear blue and white. She goes, yeah, why? She goes, well, those are my favorite colors and I like to wear them. And I thought, you know, I could wear well, I could do that. What's stop? It's my favorite color. Why do I have to like, you know, every like five day or two weeks, I go, oh, I get to wear blue today. And I went, wait, that's ridiculous. I like blue. Yeah, but so you then I got exactly really into the it. same shade of blue car, blue, electric blue car. It's a electric bit blue. much. Yeah, it was a lot coming at me down the road. That's for sure. <laughs> well, I mean, there's no denying it. I like blue. I mean, I've, I've done movies. They go, what do you want to wear? I go, blue. That's it. Well, I look best in blue. I've worn all the colors. I do, but I, I really like blue. Look, I'm wearing white. And the I'm only impressed. reason I'm wearing this white jacket is because I got a haircut for you. Oh, you got a haircut for me? And I left my blue. Did you tell them that it was yeah, for me? Yes. No, it I cut. didn't tell them because they wouldn't have believed me. But I left my blue jacket at the hairdresser. <laughs> so I had to put on this. I heard that Summer you sang Summer. the uh, national anthem for the Dodgers. Yeah, that was great. I got to, uh, well, what happened was I did a league of their own and, and it was a hit and it was a baseball movie. So I got invited to this thing called the Hollywood stars game that they would have for, they've had for years at Dodger stadium. So you, if you, if you get invited, you get to like, they give you a uniform. You're in the, in the Dodgers, you know, the, yeah. the, the locker I threw room, the first pitch for it. Yeah. Your, like a baseball player. And then you yeah. get to go out and play baseball in Dodger stadium. And, uh, from when I was seven to 15 that I wanted to be a baseball player. And I know in, uh, you know, in England, you know, everyone it's wants cricket. to, yeah, cricket or soccer, but back in the sixties, baseball was, it was as big as foot, the NFL is today. It, and the NFL and basketball were, were around, but it was much smaller, but baseball was it. Yeah. And, uh, I grew up in the Valley in the San Fernando Valley. Maybe there's a million people. There's like a hundred thousand kids in little league. Like that was like, so I was obsessed with Willie Mays and all this. So now I get to play baseball in Dodger stadium. And um, so one time I, I was playing in the game and I was sitting next to uh, Cuba Gooding Jr. And Gary Owens was the uh, announcer and Gary Owens on the show laughing. He was the announcer on laughing. Right. Very funny guy. So I said to Cuba, I go, God, I wish they'd ask me to go up there and announce. And he goes, well, go by and ask him. I go, you think I should? He goes, yeah. I go, mm, all right. But I didn't say anything. I just walked by Gary. I went, hi, Gary. He goes, oh, hi, John. You want to you wanna announce? I go, Oh, oh, <laughs> <Okay>. all right. <laughs> so I started doing that. It was really fun. So the next, every year after that, they'd have me announce an inning or two. He did it. You know, he was great, but they had me announce an inning or two. And then one, and I wanted to sing the national anthem. I like to sing. Okay. How good are you? How good? Because I just had Dr. Drew here and he sang. Oh, he's like an opera singer. Uh, yeah, he? yeah. And he sang when I kind of, I, so I threw the first pitch for the Dodgers at mm. Dodger Stadium. I did that for an LGBT game. I also hit the thing for the putt for the Kings. And when I did the thing for the Kings, Dr. Drew sang the national anthem. And you know what he did? He sat here and he gave me a little rendition. So will you do that? Come on. Yes. And then I'll give you medical advice. Oh, like Dr. please. Drew. Just one line. Oh, <clears throat> say. Okay, go on. Oh, say, can you see 
by the dawn's early light. Come on, more. Just no, give me a little bit more. No, it's too long. Oh, okay. Okay, well, that was great. Okay, so you seriously, you love singing. Say to well. that star-spangled <laughs> banner yet wait. Who knew? What? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so you're really good at tennis. You're a great singer. You could do that, and you can play the and piano. And I can sing all styles. And, and you know, can that's play, just one style. You can play the piano. Yes. Oh God, come on! You got to do it later, just all right. in a little while. Okay, well I've got to have you round here. You've got to entertain us through COVID. <laughs> so what have you been doing? So at, at home, are you on your own, pretty much, or? I mean, not- I, yeah, I live alone with my pets. You know. Yeah. And uh, boy, if I didn't have them, I'd. I don't, I don't, ooh, it'd be rough. Yeah, we've noticed a lot of dogs have been adopted through the whole COVID. Hopefully they're not. A lot, yeah. Yeah, for people, companion pets. Yeah, I've had my dog for nine years. I always say, people say this, but it's true. I go, I rescued my dog, but he rescued me. It was a bad time. And this, he was only uh, uh, six months old. He's been, he has credits. He was in the movie Mother's Day. Gary Marshall said, yeah, let him put the dog in it. And then he was in a, a Celebrity Apprentice I did. Uh, he was all over that. Who did you do Celebrity Apprentice with then? Uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Oh, right. And how was that? Um, well, it was interesting. I mean, Arnold's a great guy. I'm fr- I've known him forever. I-, I-, I think he's great. I really admire him. I did my character Master Thespian, and I actually made fun of him. You know? And I go, I, I taught all the great actors, Gilgood, O'Toole, Schwarzenegger. Yes! <laughs> All those muscles he has. Acting, <laughs> my God, the man's a stick. <laughs> Joel picks me up. I don't know where I was. We're in this limo. I'm with Joel and Jesse Ventura and Arnold. And then Joel goes, do that bit you did about him. I go, oh, well, all right. In so front I did of it, him? Uh, yeah, so I did it for him. And I said, listen, I, I go, I, 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 you know, I was making fun of you because you said you wanted to be an actor. I read it and I go, and I thought, this is ridiculous. ridiculous. I go, and then you did it. And I go, and I can't not tell you how much I admire that. And I was totally wrong. And I'll never underestimate you again, ever. You know, I had, I was wrong. I had no idea how, uh, how, the guy's like a genius. You know, he has a business degree, he's smart, and he doesn't take anything for granted. And I said, did you ever think you would be a movie star? He goes, God, no. He goes, he said, you know, in Austria, it wasn't allowed. He goes, I would have had to have been born in a certain town and gone to a certain um a uh, 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 school, and because I wasn't in that town, I wouldn't have been allowed in that school. And he goes, but it's America. He goes, nobody stops you. Uh, he had no money. He came from another country. He didn't speak English. And look what he accomplished. And it's inspiring. You know, it's like I looked. I don't look for people to go give me something. I look like how did I say? How did you do that? What did you do? How can I, you know, make something of myself too? Now, did I have an advantage growing up? Yeah, my dad was a doctor. But his parents what, were. What was in, your father in, a doctor of? Uh, in, internal medicine, but oh, wow. in the valley, he built Tarzana Hospital. You see his picture. Really? There. Yeah, he was very successful. But but he worked his butt off. But then his father came, and mother came from Romania, and then then didn't, didn't speak English. Nothing, you know. And somehow my grandfather, he owned a grocery store, and he uh, apparently went bankrupt three times. But yet he sent all his kids to school. I I don't know. He, he was smart, but he didn't have the. You know, he didn't speak English. He didn't have the education, but they made sure that their kids, you know. Did you ever think well. that and you so, wanted to follow in your father's footsteps? And no, I didn't. I, I I didn't like it, and I didn't want. I didn't feel like I could compete with him. I'd be compared. It wouldn't be good. And he wanted to be an opera singer, so he'd say, "I would never tell you what to do. You know, uh, uh, do what you want." But I, I, he, when I was in college, he said, "You know, after college, you're on your own." And I went, "Okay." And I didn't know anything, and so. I basically, I lived on $600 a month for seven years. You know, you'd make, I made five bucks an hour and then, uh, what were you doing then? Take 200 out what, of, what were you doing? I worked for this guy, Rick Pallack. who was a patient. My dad's he got a job at a clothing store. I moved to New York. I worked at a Xerox store. I was a waiter. I worked. Uh, were you practicing? Were you doing stand up or anything? Or were you just, well, I was, like- I was after I did four years, I did plays in high school. Then I had four years at UC Irvine as a drama major. So my article furniture arrived and I absolutely loved it because Article's newest collection encourages the mixing and matches of style, color, palettes and textures to breathe life and warmth into your space as we head into the new year. 
keep your eyes peeled and your Instagram open for inspiration, featuring Article's latest looks. Article combines the curation of boutique furniture store with the comfort and simplicity of shopping online. And shopping online can be complicated, but it's really, really easy. Article focuses on beautifully crafted pieces, quality materials, and durable construction. The pieces I got are high quality and I love the design and the guest room is now complete with the bed frame, end tables and lamp. And their website was really easy to navigate and I'm useless at that. So I'll definitely be going back for more items soon. They offer fast, affordable shipping across the US and Canada and it's free on orders over $999 with a 30 day return policy. Article is offering my listeners $50 off your first purchase of $100 or more. So go to article.com slash Lisa and the discount will be automatically applied at checkout. That's article.com slash Lisa to get $50 off your first purchase of $100 or more. How did you get your first agent? Well, I was we're at, at the clothing, working at the clothing store and Rick became friends with this agent, Marty Klein. Who, was a, who ran APA and he was like Steve Martin's agent and Paul Rubens, it was Pee Wee Herman. So I kept bugging Rick, like, introduce me, introduce me. So they sent my, this guy, Mike Eisenstadt, who was an assistant to an agent, John Carraro. So, so um, Mike saw me at the, at the groundlings and Marty said he would send somebody and his, he had a secretary, Lorraine. And Lorraine was like three weeks, she goes, I'll get Mike to go. So literally his secretary, Lorraine, right. and Marty. So Mike said, this guy's good. And then I, uh, in, in September of 84 and then January of 85, we had a new show, The Groundlings, and I was doing my liar character. And on March 28th, they booked us on The Tonight Show. Jim McCauley pro- produced uh, that the com- com- comedy segments on The Tonight Show. And, you know, that was the only late night show back then, and it was huge. So if you got on that, you could have a career. So, I, so they did uh, three sketches. I was in two of them on The Tonight Show, and one was doing the liar character. Well, the guy, Mike Eisenstadt, that had been an assistant three years ago to uh, John Carraro, now he was an agent. So he brought me in. He said, I think I can get you signed now. So that's, I, I got him. And then I started getting all these auditions. Or I wanted to audition, but I had no money. I was a messenger. And I said, Mike, can you get me Hold extra on a second. Work? So you did two sketches on The Tonight Show, but you had no money and you were a messenger. Right. So right. that wasn't like an automatic kind of leap to stardom, just doing two sketches on the Tonight Show. Well, it got me. Mike could sign me, right? But it, you know, it was one. Right. No, one time does it give you so a career? So I, so I, it helped, well, it got me the agent, which was a huge hurdle. Yeah, uh, he signed me, and then I said, Mike, can you get me extra work on soaps because I'm going to run out of money. I, I don't have any money, and and I was making like, you know, forty bucks a day, and soaps was like ninety a day doing extra work, I, and I went to New York for about a year and I came back to work at the store. After I did the paper chase, I quit the clothing store. I just couldn't go back. I just was like, right. it was too limiting. Like yeah. I just couldn't. Yeah. So Mike said, well, I don't think you should do it. I think about it for a day if you want to do it, but uh, there's auditions coming up. I think you should wait. And so the next day I said, all right, I'll wait. And then a few weeks, three weeks later, I got an, uh, an audition and I got a movie with Charles Grodin and a recurring role in a series in the same day. Oh, wow. And all of a sudden, everyone was saying yes. And then when I did the movie with Charles Grodin, at the, oh, at, in the meantime, it was all over in June now that Lauren Michaels was coming back to S- Saturday Night Live. And so Mike said, well, hey, what about Saturday Night Live? And I said, are you crazy? He goes, no, I'm serious. I said, hey, Mike, I have a better idea. Why don't I land on Pluto? <laughs> he goes, what? I go, I go You're that, because that's what it was. Yeah. It was that world where those people lived. It's another world. He goes, no, I'm serious. I, and he would say it so much. And I said, well, you just shut up about it. You're ridiculous. It was so absurd to me. And he said, well, I'm going to submit your tape anyway. And he did. And, uh, you know, of course, that helped me. I met with Lauren at the Beverly Hills Hotel, ironically. And I remember uh, uh, I'd never been there. And I remember driving up to the hotel. And, all, and we stopped. And then Michael Caine walked across where I stopped to park in the valet and Michael Caine walked across like that. Wow. And then I went back to Catalina Island and then uh, shot, worked on a Monday. And then on Tuesday, I, I get off, uh, come back to San Pedro off the boat. And my agent there goes, they're flying to New York. Are you kidding? Oh, in the meantime, I'd met with uh, Al Franken and Tom Davis for producing the show that year. And then I met with them. Then they came to the Growlings to see a showcase. And I was doing Master Thespian, that character. 
at the sketch and nobody was laughing in the audience at all, except for Al. And I always say to Al, I remember thinking, oh, thank God that Saturday Night Live guy's laughing. And then I always make him laugh. <laughs> he was the only one laughing. But I go like, well, I guess it doesn't matter. He's laughing. Right. And then we auditioned and they brought out, they flew out three, uh, six people from Los Angeles. And the men, all unknown was myself, Dennis Miller and Damon Waynes. And the, the women were um, Julie Brown, who had a song, da uh, da not Downtown Julie Brown, the VJ, but Julie Brown who sang the song, The Prom Queen's Got a Gun, and Jennifer Tilly and uh, Pam Madison, who was a great stand-up. And um, first we had audition in front of all these people. And I remember Damon went in. He goes, if they laugh, they laugh. They don't, they don't. I don't care. He came out 15 minutes later and his, he's sweating. His eyes are glazed over like, like, what happened? Like he was like- What, it went really well or it was horrific? No, so stressful. You oh know, God, he what, just, nobody he laughed? Thought, he probably thought he blew it. I don't know. They said they might not laugh. So I went in and I did, and they're just, you're standing there in front of like 35 people and they're just talking and I'm just standing and in front of them waiting and waiting. So finally I went, hello. Yeah. You know, I'm like, so I did my stuff, characters and then Lawrence said, do you have anything else? And I tried doing a standup routine. I'd never done it. And uh, I mean, this is how ridiculous show business was. So Fred, he was in charge of casting Saturday Night Live in Los Angeles. And Fred had been a dentist. And I go, oh, I better do something else. So I go, all right, well, here's what I would do while you're setting up for sketches. So I tried the stand-up thing that I did. And nobody was laughing. And I remember thinking, just keep going, keep going. Like, don't stop. <laughs> I should have just How stopped. How does that actually feel when you're doing something? Well, you're putting horrible. your life in jail. So I left and the room. I was just, like, yeah. Damon, I was sweating. My eyes were glazed over. And I go, oh, that's why he was like that. I thought I just blew the biggest opportunity of my life. And then the next day, um, they put us on camera. And, and then Lord, I was on, and I watched Dennis Miller. I was waiting for like four hours. I was falling asleep. Then I was getting nervous and falling asleep. So I did this bit for him that I, I, I did with Tim Stack about two guys in the front lines and like in France and World War II soldiers. How did they end up in the war? And, I, and Tim did it originally. And then he, when I got in the groundlings, he added me in. It was, it was a monologue about how did I end up in the war? A brown paper bag came in the mail one day. Wrapped inside <laughs> was a uniform. Grandma got to it first. And I, anyway, I was imitating Dana Andrews. So R Lawrence says, Randy, stand next to John. And Tim Stack, who I did it, was 6'4". Well, Randy's also 6'4". So as I'm doing the monologue, this is what got me the show. This is what's crazy. Uh, and Lawrence said, do you have anything else? So Randy goes, why don't you do that thing about your grandmother that I, I just done it for Randy in the hall. I went, all right. So I go, so I go, all right, this is two guys in the front lines saying how they ended up in World War II. And I go, I go how'd I end up here in the war? I go, a, a package came in the mail one day, wrapped inside was a uniform with my name on it. Grandma got to it first. Didn't want to lose the only man with rubber feet. So she put it on, took my place. Nobody knew. And that because got that, you the job? No, no, wait, I'll tell you. Because that uniform fit her like a glove. Right after she added about 15 yards of spandex material. You see, Captain, and that's when I, I looked up at Randy, I went, you see, Captain? Like that. Because in my mind, I went, oh, he's 6'4", like Tim. Yeah. Go, you see, Captain. Grandma was what you call a hefty gal. Oh, she liked to eat. In fact, she was quite the chow hound. Chow hound? Oh, my God. <laughs> he was a fat pig. <laughs> oh, my God. But anyway, when her platoon boat hit the beach, the old beef cow rolled off the deck, tried to crawl under a barbed wire fence. So every time I'd see him, he goes, yeah, you got the show. He goes, I go, why did you cast me? He goes, Al, you know, you were everything we weren't looking for <laughs> in one person, but you were funny. Right. When? He goes, that thing, when you went like that. I go, I wasn't even trying to be funny. <laughs> I was just looking like, oh, just like And Tim. that got you the job. What's going on now in the comedy forum is, it's yes. so, no, but it, it's, it, you don't have to talk in the English accent. It's fine. It's fine. No, I'm talking like an expert. Okay, right. Um. But <laughs> oh, feel free to it's take the piss out to, of me. Darling, it's okay. It's taste, fine. It? You're my neighbor. You're my friend. You can take the piss out of me all day long. It's not like I've got anything else to do. But I want no, to. No, believe me. Everybody loves English accent. They're jealous. I mean, okay, I wish, good. No, it's very like. Debonair. Yeah, and it sounds great. You can just listen to it. and. Okay, so now we're in a whole new era. Okay, we've been through the Me Too thing. We've been through every 
possible kind of, well, not every possible we've had. It's all about acceptance. It's all about inclusion. And it's all about being politically correct. So how do you feel much more confined now as a comedian? The fact that everything you say is going to be scrutinized. And with social, social media, before it was just like you could put it out there and stand up and it wasn't going to come back and bite you in the ass. And now it seems like everybody's got to be scared to say anything. Well, I guess, but I mean, it, I think you have to have a joke behind what you say. If you just say something and there's no joke, then it, it doesn't, it's not funny. See, if you don't have the ability to uh, laugh at yourself, I make fun of myself in my act, you know, and, and others. But if you don't have the ability to laugh at yourself, don't go to a comedy club. Like, just don't. But people go, oh, just because you're a comedian and a, on stage at a comedy club doing your act, that means everything you say is a joke. Yes, it's a joke. I mean, is there is there a truth in it? And yeah, but it's also a joke. It's not, you know, like um, there's a thing. It's called irony, you know. And and if you don't understand irony, and if you're taking everything I say literally, but people are now. To that's me, my then, point. I go, well, then you're an idiot. But what about now? And Today, do you it. feel like that now? No. So you don't not, change. No, your because act. because because you can't. You you couldn't do that. You couldn't do a show. What are you going to worry about? Any. I make fun of everybody, you know? And so I have, I do a joke in the act that gets a huge laugh, by the way. I say, well, let's test, test the room. Two Jews walk into a bar. They buy it. They die laughing. I go, hmm. So later on, I'll do some joke. People go, ooh. I go, oh, oh but you laughed at the Jew joke. <laughs> hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. if you're going to laugh at that, yeah. you know, and, and the point is, I didn't know what my act was about. And the fact is, I... I personally, I hate racism. I hate all that. It depends how you say it, if it's a joke. And so a lot of the stuff I say, if you listen to it, you would go, that's so idiotic. And then you, with a brain, go like, that's his point. It's like, yeah, yeah it's sure. ridiculous that somebody would think like that. Right. You know what I mean? Right. I do, but so I do So if you don't think understand irony, it's like, you know, what do you, if you don't, Monty Python, you know, you're in the... It's hilarious, but if you don't understand irony, if you don't yeah, understand, yeah, but if you if you look back, if you don't at, have a brain, then you shouldn't go to a comedy club. But if you, know? you look back at Monty Python, John Cleese, all those kind of greats, I mean, a lot of things that they said they couldn't get away with now, because everybody is so politically correct. It's almost like people have lost their sense of humor. That's my point. Yeah, but you can't be a comedian and be politically correct. That's like saying, well, you'd be an Olympic swimmer, but don't go in the pool. Right. It, for you, sure. you can't swim. Right. Yeah, for sure. You just can't do it. So it, it it's just, it's not, it's, if someone doesn't like you, go, I don't like what you said, or I don't think that's funny. I say, well, that's fine. Yeah. I think it's fine. You don't think it's funny. Okay. Now what? It, does, it doesn't mean anything. I go, well, and I go, I'm not offended. Like some people go, I don't think you're funny. I'm like, well, that's fine. Millions well, yeah, of other people come, do. Yeah, exactly. But the fact that you don't think I'm funny, it doesn't, it doesn't offend me. Right. It's not about calling people names. Uh, that offend them. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's understanding, but you can still have compassion and everything. Of course. Absolutely. I, I, so I don't make fun of people like that, but I make fun of the way they want to, all the words they go, you can't say this word and this word and this word. And it doesn't, it, it's just a word. I mean, I don't think I made that up that thinking that's what Lenny Bruce did. You know, it's the great, it's, it's, it's. What did you think of a lot of the British comedians? Did you watch 40 Towers? Yeah, I thought it was brilliant. That was, yeah, it was incredible. Hilarious. That was, yeah. But, the, I mean, that was so inappropriate. A lot of the things that used to be said and... Got... I don't remember, but, I mean, you have to... If you don't have a sense of humor, you know what I mean? Well, I'm with you. If you don't have a sense it, of humor, it, it, then you don't If you don't, don't have watch. the ability to laugh at yourself, yep. you're going to have a pretty, I think, miserable, pathetic life. You know, it, it's... it's Like, I'll give you a good example. It was a, um, a, a Jackie Mason... He was like a huge comedian on Ed Sullivan, and then he got in trouble, and, they, and he thought- What did he someone, get in trouble for? Well, he was the Ed Sullivan show, and someone held up a finger, but it looked like he was, they flipping off, so they went like this, right? He goes, oh, you give me a finger? Here, I'll give you a finger. Here's two fingers. What are you doing? You know, he didn't- Right. So they go, oh, you flipped off on air. It just, just responded, because he, I think he thought somebody was like right. flipping him off. Right. So it killed his career. And don't take yourself too seriously, absolutely. No, I mean, I mean- so, I mean, I, you can't do comedy and, I, I mean, you make fun of people. You know what I mean? So if, you, if you're going to, like, take everything a comedian says literally. Well, no. I'm not. I you mean, know, I if you have get a mad, great if, sense What of about humor? in real life if you get mad at someone? I could kill that guy. You go, oh, you're under arrest. You just threatened that you, you said you could kill him. Oh, how do I know you're not going to? Well, I, it's a figure of speech. Well, I don't know that. Right, right, right. For sure. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous, you know. 
But I get the part about being inclusive and, 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 and that part's good. Hey, listen, you know, I, I'm all about having a good time and I think more than anything we need comedians to cheer us up and everything because it's all getting too fucking serious out there. Well, it's uh, Saturday Night Live. Like, they do sketches and then they analyze it like it was the news. I, I mean, I think they're probably a lot more aggressive about the politicians over here. I mean, they've all, always had a good time in England. So yeah, yeah, but I was on Saturday Night but... Live and the point is that whenever there's an election, they always have some, they always make fun of whoever's president and whoever's, Yeah. Uh, they always do political I mean, humor. he gives them a lot to Non-stop. work with. I mean, for sure. It, it, it's it's easy for them, that's for sure. Yeah, <laughs> but it wouldn't matter if, 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 the point is it doesn't matter who the president is. That's who they're going to satirize. Yeah. When they do political humor. It doesn't matter, it's not about, it's, it's not, it's just who's ever in office. For sure. Like when 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 I was um, well I mean anyway in eighty eight, so they had the uh, the Democrats running for president. George Bush Senior was president, so they so they there were seven guys people running for president. So they said to me, "Are right, you're going to play Michael Dukakis?" And oh I'm wow! Like, who's that? Who's that? And they go, "He's the he's the the governor of Massachusetts, and he's running." And the only reason they picked me to play Michael Dukakis was. Because they felt that they could make me look like him. Right. Right. That's the only reason. So I had to learn how to imitate him and Al Franken. How much time do you actually spend kind of then analyzing their voice? Oh, hours. I would watch really? tape over and over and over. Yeah. And I approach like an actor. I go, the way he, like he has a certain, you know, they, for me, when I do an impression, like they have a certain speech pattern. Right. And everything. So I work like an actor. I go, well, how are they? I have to make it up, of course. What are they thinking that makes them speak like that and look like that and have those mannerisms? And so I have to make it up in my mind what I think is would make me look and talk like that, right? And so that's how I approach it. So and then Dukakis won. Uh, uh, Michael Dukakis won the the nomination. So then they had the debate. So they had me as Dukakis and Dana Carvey as playing Bush. So we did a debate, and there's this famous thing where I go, I can't believe I'm losing to this guy. Keep playing that. Now, if Dukakis had won, then I'd have been playing right. the president yeah. myself for four yes. years. But yes, Bush yeah. won, you know. And I remember saying, boy, this is the first time the, the outcome of the presidential election Changed your life. affected me. Yeah, so Alec directly. Baldwin's got a lot like, to I mean, be thankful I mean, directly in my career, it was very weird. Okay, so I must I have a question. Love is it. Van de Pump your real last name? No, I made it up. Who would make up a name like that? Give me a is break. Is it huh? Dutch and... You think I tried to from, get rid of that name? It's it's Dutch. Is Van der Dutch and Pump is from... I don't want to get nasty. Love Pump. It's Dutch. It was my porno name, and then I thought I'd stick with it. So wonderful... Does it mean wonderful Pump? Yeah, that's exactly... Brilliant it. shag. Uh, really brilliant shag. <laughs> Stop it. There might be some people Depends, like, that would disagree with you. How dare you? <laughs> That's okay. He doesn't care. Um, Vanderpump is a Dutch name. Okay. So Raphael Canofa says, what's your favorite Saturday Night Live sketch? You well, one of them oh, was called, uh, Phil Hartman and I did it called One More Mission. And it's, it's uh, a spoof of the movies from the 40s. Now they talk really fast. And he and I would always do it. And we wrote the sketch together. And. Is he? He's not alive now, is he? Bill no, Hart. no. Okay, so Donna Solverson says, what was it like filming Friends? You were in Friends? What did you yeah, do yes, in Friends? twice. What did you do? Well, I played um, a restaurant owner in the first one. I could have taught you how to be a restaurant owner. Yes. You should have the, come here for little tips. And the second one, I was the same guy who lost everything. But the first, what happened was I, I, um, you know, I grew up in the Valley, and so um, Lisa Cooter on Friends, it's like my, I've noticed that she's five. I her did bro- the comeback with her. Oh, you did? Oh, well, I, I grew up with her family. Lovely. So, yes. Love. So she's like my little sister. So her family, her parents like my parents, you know, and her brother David's like brother since we're 11. Yeah, she's great. So she, when she got the show and uh, and then I did a movie with Courtney Cox and became friends with her called Mr. Destiny in 88. So now it's 1994. So they both called me up and asked me to guest star on it. And I did it, and I thought the show, at the time, it wasn't a giant hit. It just started, but I watched it, and I go, I said to David, what do you think of your sister's show? I watched it. It's all right. I go, I think it's good. I think it's cute. So I did it, and I thought it'll be fun for Lisa's parents to see us, you know, working yes. together. And then 
nine years later, I had to beg to go back. But anyway, by the time that show aired, it was huge. So at the time they treated, I was like their first famous guest star and they were treating me like it's such a big favor and everything. And then and you years, say- by the time it aired, it <laughs> become a phenomenon. I'm like, well, they did me the favor. Yeah. And then nine years later, I'm like, please, I need to be on the show again. And so what did you do? So they brought me back and I was like, this, they didn't say I was the same guy, but I was. And I was on a date with Jennifer Aniston, and, but I'd lost everything. I was just a total loser. And, but it was very funny. And it was- well, you were on a date with Jennifer Aniston and I missed this? On Friends. Did you get to make out with her and stuff? No, it was a disaster. Well, I'm still going to look for it anyway. They're both online. Next one, Matt Rays. What do you think of the political nature of SNL these days? Yes, Matt, I was thinking too. Do you think you could be a cast member now or are you glad you did it when you did? Well, I would be thrilled to be on it any time. But yeah, of course I was thrilled when I got it. I couldn't, I couldn't believe I was on a show. I couldn't even say it. But what are you doing? I go, oh, I'm on Saturday and I, <laughs> I literally could couldn't say, say it until I was because I was just so overwhelmed that I was on it. I just couldn't believe it. And uh, you were on yeah, it for five was, years. It, yes. The end of the fifth year, I was like, finally. Oh, you could it, say it. It's a lot of pressure. It, it, but yeah, it was great. It was, it was phenomenal. You know, it was, it was amazing. It was, it was um, you know, it changed my life. You know, it gave me everything. And um, I don't know what this person's talking about. Rafi Cano says, did you have any idea that people would still be using? Now, that's the ticket. What's that mean? You don't know what that means? No. Educate me. Wake up and educate me. What does uh, it mean? The research Well, department. now that's the ticket. <laughs> There's no research well, department. I did it's my just me. Saturday Night Live, uh, my, when I was on this and I traded my liar character. Yeah. So I'd say, hello, my name is, it's from the, like a guy from the old movies. You know, my name is Tommy Flanagan. I'm a member of Pathological Liars Anonymous. In fact, I, I'm a, the president of that organization. Yeah, that's the ticket. So he's just lying. So that became a huge catch for him. Oh, I see. And they still say, if you, you, now, whenever a politician lies, they still bring that up. They sound like my liar character. Oh, I see. Okay. Yes, we see, now, I'm English. It's, we didn't it's, it's get Saturday night. Me. We didn't get Saturday night live. They, oh. they are now, by the way. They're well, they have an it. SNL app. You can look at it now. I wasn't looking for it then. You never saw me do Master Thespian? Huh? What? You would be going, John, brilliant. It's brilliant. It's making fun of all the English William. actors, Shakespearean English actors. <laughs> I'll show it to you. You would go, oh my God. Really? Do you know how many people I know like that? Do you think I'd really talk like that? You? Yes, me. No, I think you're talking to this. Oh, I don't talk like that. No, no, no. no, no. Like Queen's that. English. I speak the Queen's English. English. Okay, I think oh, you man, spoke like no, Eliza I'm Delittle. I'm going to say... John Lovitz, thank you so much for honoring me with your navelly presence. <laughs> I'm never letting you in again. You're welcome, Eliza Doolittle. <laughs> so remember to like or subscribe wherever you watch. And remember, yeah, to watch us on YouTube. And uh, thank you. And I'll be back when I have uh, more things to plug, right? Yeah, exactly. I, I very much hope so. I hope if so. If I don't too, let you in, you can jump the fence. <laughs> <laughs>